Okay. Welcome, everybody. Once again, this is our little soiree, Conspiracy or Not, Here We Come. My name is Aaron, and I'm joined, as always, with the lovely Amy and our co-host, Gandalf. And look who we have, Michael Cremo, world-renowned author, researcher, and lecturer. Michael Cremo, welcome, sir, and thank you for your time. Good to be with you and all your viewers. Um, Amy, Gandalf, you guys doing okay? Doing good, bro. Great. Um, Michael, I'm not sure if you remember. I know you're kind of a busy guy jet sitting around the world giving lectures and speeches to colleges and the, the, the international, the World International um, Archaeological Congress. Uh, you're, you're a busy guy, um, but this is your second appearance with us, and I'm, I'm very, very pleased to have you with us. And again, I just want to thank you for your time. I am hanging in here pretty well. Oh. Wow, Amy, you're uh, breaking up terribly, honey. <laughs> uh, Michael, um, this is your second appearance. Um, it's been a while since we've spoken. What have you been up to lately? Well, the most recent set of lectures I gave was in the St. Louis area. You know, I spoke at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, and places like that. So that's part of what I do. It's like in, in my project, I'm doing research into archaeological evidence for extreme human antiquity. And that means a few things, you know, just like a musician, you know, has to engage in some composing of songs and then recording them and then going out and representing them. I've, I've got to do the same sort of thing. I'm continually doing more research and writing, but then they've got to get out there somehow, get published. And then when they are out there, I represent the, the topics in lectures and interviews. So basically, that's what's going on pretty much all the time for me in one way or another. So I actually was lucky enough uh, many years ago, I read your book, The Forbidden Archaeologist. Um, I have not read the 900-page tome, Forbidden Archaeology, uh, but I did read your other book, The Forbidden Archaeologist. I'm curious, would you do, do, would you do me and do my guests a favor, because there's always new people coming into this information, um, would you do us a favor and just give us your bio, give us a little bit of a rundown as to who you are, and literally how did you, how did you really get started into all this, and, and how is it that someone like yourself is invited all over the world I mean, I know that you're an author, but I mean, the things that you write about are kind of controversial, but just give us your bio, tell us how you got started, and, um, and we'll go from there. Yeah, well, how I got started probably has uh, something to do with the way I was raised. My father was an intelligence officer in the United States Air Force, so that meant as a, a child, as a person growing up, I was moving to a lot of different places in the United States and around the world. So in, in, in the course of all that, I, I got exposed to a lot of different worldviews and cultures. And among the ones I got exposed to, the spiritual culture of ancient India made the biggest impression on me. And eventually I became the disciple of a, a guru from India, Bhaktivedanta Swami was his name. And uh, as part of my relationship with him, I began to study the ancient Sanskrit writings of India. And in those writings, I encountered descriptions of human populations existing on Earth millions and millions of years ago, going all the way back to the very beginnings of the history of life on Earth. 
Now, this was something completely different than anything I learned from my teachers in high school or at university. And I had to wonder, are these accounts of extreme human antiquity that we find in the ancient Indian wisdom tradition and also many other ancient wisdom traditions, you can find the same thing, the idea of a very ancient human presence. How am I to regard those accounts? Do I take them as kind of poetic inventions, some kind of mythology, or is there any factual basis to them? Now, when, when I began to think about that, I, I, I had to take into account the fact that most scientists today accept that human beings like us have only been around for about 200,000 years or so. Before that, there wouldn't have been any humans like us, according to what they now believe mostly. So I, I decided I, I wanted to look at the whole history of archaeology not just what you see in today's textbooks, because the evidence you see in today's textbooks is only part of the complete data set. It's the part of the complete archaeological data set that supports the dominant paradigm today, namely the idea that humans like us appeared fairly recently on, on this planet. So I decided to go beyond the textbooks and start digging into the whole history of archeology span going all the way back to the time of Darwin in the mid 19th century. And when I did that, when I started going through the original reports of archaeologists, geologists, and other scientists who are digging into the earth, I was surprised to find numerous accounts published in the scientific literature, not only in English, but in German, French, Italian, Spanish, and other languages. Uh, many reports of scientists discovering human bones, human footprints, human artifacts, many millions of years old. And you know, originally I thought, okay, I'll, I'll do maybe eight days of research. I'll write a short article about, a, about what I find. Uh, but, you know, the, the eight days turned into eight weeks, and the eight weeks turned into eight months, and the eight months turned into eight years of research, because one case led to another, and then to another, and to another. So I could begin to see there was a massive cover-up going on that... I mean, there were there are hundreds of these cases enough, uh, as as you mentioned, to fill up a nine hundred page book. That was the book Forbidden Archaeology. Some people call it Forbidding Archaeology because it looks kind of too heavy to pick up, <laughs> you know. But uh, so that's how I got into this. And you know, I had to ask myself a question. If these reports are there in the scientific literature, then why aren't they mentioned in today's textbooks? Why are they, in a sense, forbidden? And I put that down to what I call a process of knowledge filtration that operates in the world of science you know, reports of evidence that conform to the dominant consensus or paradigm will pass through that 
filter very easily, and that means you'll read about it in the textbooks. But if you've got evidence that radically contradicts the dominant consensus, it tends to be filtered out, ignored, forgotten, explained away, in some cases actively suppressed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, around here we call that compartmentalization um, in the circles that we travel in. So that's not at all something that we're unfamiliar with this entire. Oh, that's time. a good term. Um, so are you are you actually a trained archaeologist? This is something I've never uh, I've listened to your um, interviews, dozens and dozens and dozens of interviews from you. I, I don't think I've ever actually heard anyone ask you, are you actually a trained archaeologist? No. And, you know, I think it was Aristotle that once said there are two kinds of people who are qualified to speak on a topic with authority. One is the trained expert. The other is the person of general knowledge and intelligence who can uh, apply that knowledge and intelligence to specialized fields of work. So, uh, I've educated myself about the whole history of archaeology. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. When the book came out, it was, was reviewed in a lot of the professional journals of archaeology, anthropology, history of science, and things like that. And the you know some some of them of course were harshly negative kinds of reviews, but some of them even though they may not have agreed with what I was saying, they had to admit this is valuable work. It's bringing to light issues about the history of our discipline that can cause us to kind of reevaluate our our view of things and i and i found i've been able to communicate with archaeologists although i'm coming at things from an entirely different angle of vision i've been able to present things in such a way that i'm able to give papers about my work at major international conferences on archaeology. Uh, there are some in the world of archaeology today who are interested in what archaeology looks like from various perspectives. Uh, they have the view that, well, Western scientific archaeology and its conclusions, that's not the whole picture. There can be other archaeologies. In fact, the, the scientific journal of the World Archaeological Congress, which is one of the biggest international organizations of professional archaeologists is called archaeologies. In other words, there can be an archaeology from a Native American Indian perspective or a Pacific Islander perspective or an Australian Aboriginal perspective or, as in my case, a perspective with roots in the ancient Vedic tradition of India, and they're open to hearing about that. Now, there are some that don't want to hear about any alternatives or contradictory evidence. There is that group, but there are also members of this other group. So I've been able to present papers at over... Uh, two dozen over 20 meetings of the World Archaeological Congress, the European Association of Archaeologists. And I consider them to be part of my audience. 
of course, I, I present things to a lot of different audiences, university audiences, scientific audiences, alternative science audiences, conspiracy theory audiences, um, mystical and paranormal researchers. I was really surprised when Forbidden Archaeology was published. I started getting invitations to speak at UFO conferences. <sighs> and I had to think, they're interested in UFOs. I'm talking about ancient stones and bones. What's the connecting link? And I think the connecting link is the knowledge filtering process because in, in these fields like UFO research, extraterrestrial research, there's a tremendous amount of knowledge filtering going on. There are many credible reports of evidence for these uh, paranormal and extraterrestrial phenomena that have been made by credible people, in many cases, trained scientists. But you don't hear very much about it in the mainstream scientific circles because of that process of knowledge filtration that is responsible for filtering out say the archaeological evidence for extreme human antiquity well a moment ago you brought up perspective and i'm glad you did because that's one of the questions in uh, in one of the notes that i have for you um being that you are a member of isoc which is the international society of krishna consciousness um i was curious as to how specifically your particular perspective on these subjects is affected being that um, that you're part of this uh, this international Krishna consciousness group and the uh, Bhaktivedanta, um, Bhaktivedanta uh, Swami uh, Prabhupada is the guy who is he not correct me if I'm wrong but is, is he not the guy who translated the um, the Bhagavad Gita uh, into uh, English is that Am I on the right track here? Yeah, you're on the right track. And I kind of mentioned that in my introductory remarks that I became the disciple of a guru from India, Bhaktivedanta Swami, and that it was under his influence, you know, reading some of the works that he translated from Sanskrit into English, like the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Purana, and others. It was in those works that I first encountered this idea of extreme human antiquity, the idea that humans like us have been present on Earth for millions and millions of years going all the way back to the very beginnings of the history of life on Earth. If I hadn't encountered that point of view, which I readily admit I got from study of his works, I wouldn't have had any reason really to question what my teachers were telling me in high school and university when I went there and who are basically in control of the entire education system and the scientific institutions, I wouldn't have had any real reason to question any of that because, you know, you would open up the textbook, they'd say, this is the theory, this is what's happening, here's the evidence, it all supports what we're saying, end of story. Uh, when I found out that actually there's more evidence to be considered than what you find in today's textbooks, that was kind of a revelation. I'm curious, how is it you're 
how was it you came to meet Bhakti Vedanta? I actually met him through his books. It's, uh, I mean, this happened in the early 1970s when I was in my early 20s. I had gone to a Grateful Dead concert <laughs> and I received a copy of Bhagavad Gita as it is by Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada from some members of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness who were at that concert, Grateful Dead concert in upstate New York in the early 1970s. So I took the book home and read it. It made a lot of sense to me. And then I followed up on it, you know, to get some more, some more literature. And I visited one of the centers of the society. And then later I was able to hear Bhaktivedanta Swami give some lectures. So you're telling me that it was purely by chance that some people at a concert gave you a copy of Swami Bhaktivedanta's book translated of the Bhagavad Gita. And, and that's how you literally got started on this. It was just a matter of chance. Um, I, on one level, it looks like chance, but on another level, if you ask me what I really think about it is that this is something I began in a previous lifetime. And in this lifetime, by the arrangement of the cosmos, I picked it up again. So you could say on a certain level, it, it apparently looks like chance, but I think things happen for a reason in our, our lives. You know, there are critical events that determine the path of our lives. And you could say that on a certain level, they appear to be chance events, but uh, with a different perspective, it may be seen as an arrangement, something destined to happen. So you were initiated into the, um, the ISOC, the International Society of Krishna Consciousness, by uh, Prabhupada himself. What is that like? Is there a ritual? And what does that actually mean? So to be initiated into the International Society of Krishna Consciousness? Well, it means it's, it's like, you know, you go to a university, you get a PhD, you know, you get, you enter into a connection with the line of spiritual masters or gurus that extends back through time, ultimately to the supreme conscious intelligent being known by the Sanskrit name Krishna. It's like you're connecting yourselves, yourself formally to that disciplic succession. You know, just like when you marry somebody, you're connecting yourself to their family, their lineage. So an initiation is like that. It's like a formal connection between not just the guru and the disciple, but the whole chain of gurus that that present living guru represents and he's representing not just his own thought but the tradition that's been handed down from eternity 
you know, the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, the teachings of the Vedas, the teachings of, you know, the different categories of Vedic, Vedic knowledge. So that's ultimately what's going on at the time of initiation. And you take certain vows. So you were, know, you, so that's, were you with a group? Was this an individual initiation? I mean, I'm just trying to really kind of understand the logistics and maybe a little bit about the process. Uh, it's individual and group at the same time. You know, I have a letter from Bhaktivedanta Swami in which he says, I accept Michael Cremo as my disciple. And he gave me a spiritual name as well at that time. And then uh, others in the same community that I was living in at the, at the time also received initiation. And we came together in a temple and there was a sacrificial performance conducted according to ancient Vedic rites, you know, an initiation ceremony. And so I, I look at it as individual and collective at, at the same time. You know, just like, you know, if you're getting a degree in a university, it's your degree, but other people may be at the graduation ceremony at the same time you are. So it's sort of like that. Uh, individual in the sense that it's my personal commitment, collective in the sense that other people at the same time made the same commitment. I think there were six or seven other people that received their initiation at the same time that I did. Okay, so, so what does it mean to you personally? Well, basically, I'm initiated into the practice of a certain kind of yoga. It's called bhakti yoga, the yoga of devotion. And part of the practice of bhakti yoga, the yoga of devotion, is that you use whatever talent or ability that you have as part of your yoga, the goal of which is to restore consciousness to its original pure state. Originally, according to these teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, uh, we're originally purely spiritual beings who are meant to exist on a higher level of reality beyond contact with the world of matter where conscious selves have to take on bodies made of matter that are temporary and subject to birth, death, old age, disease, things like that. Uh, if we're able to restore our consciousness to its original pure state, we can transcend that cycle of birth and death and get to the point where we have a body, a form of pure consciousness that never changes it isn't born, it doesn't die, it's existing eternally. We actually have it now, but we've forgotten about it. So the practice of bhakti yoga is meant to reawaken that original pure consciousness. And part of the practice of getting there is to use your talents and abilities 
for some higher purpose that's connected with our ultimate spiritual identities. So I have some ability for writing and researching. I could, it could be used for any purpose. I could be working for an insurance company and writing ad copy for them, trying to convince people to do this or that. Or I could have followed my, my father into one of the intelligence services. Actually, that was originally what I was going to do. When I went to university, I went to the School of International Relations at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., with the idea of going into government service at some level. I could have wound up using my talents and abilities for those kinds of things. But in, I've made the choice in my personal journey of life to take a more spiritual turn and use my talents and abilities in that. I, I, I've made it part of my practice of yoga you know just like you know if a person has artistic ability they could apply that in bhakti yoga if they have organizational ability they could apply that i i've got my abilities that i was born with and i'm just trying to use them as part of my practice of yoga and meditation so okay so you got your hands on a copy of the Bhagavad Gita and you discuss on many occasions that in in these in this literature that it it talks about human antiquity being many millions of years old um, can you talk to me about that and how is it that um, I mean of course Time scales are going to be an issue. I mean, there's going to be a lot of people curious about how that this is calculated, right? Because, like, just for instance, um, in the Bible, and I, I, by the way, I'm 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 not going to go there. Um, <laughs> there are there are some argumentation over, like, you know, when the when the Bible talks about certain characters being five, six, seven, eight, nine hundred years old that uh there's some argumentation over well maybe it was they were counting lunar cycles and things like that so when you talk, talk about millions of years old um how do what is there any verification at all besides the writings of the bhagavad gita can you just speak to that and how many millions by the way yeah it's a whole interesting topic and Bhagavad Gita, these things are mentioned in a very brief way. They're explained more in detail in the Puranas, which are the historical writings of ancient India. And among them is the Bhagavad Purana. But as far as the you know, Bhagavad Gita goes, I mean, we've been talking about it a lot. And I, I thought I'd just mention to your viewers that I've got on my website, mcremo.com, m-c-r-e-m-o.com, uh, a special offer that if anyone purchases a copy of my latest book, My Science, My Religion, they'll have the opportunity to request a free copy of the Bhagavad Gita. You know, that option is there if they purchased uh, that book, My Science, My Religion, from my website, mcremo.com. I just thought I'd throw that in there if anybody wants no, feel to, free take, to your books take advantage of that. But Certainly. getting back to the time concept, the Vedic time concept is cyclical. And... The basic unit of Vedic cyclical time is called the day of Brahma 
or the Kalpa. And it's 4,320,000,000 years long. It's followed by a night of Brahma, which is the same length. Then there's another day of Brahma, another night of Brahma, another day. And during the days of Brahma, life, including human life, is manifest in the universe. And during the nights of Brahma, it's not manifest. It's dormant in a sleeping state, you could say. So according to the Vedic cosmological calendar, we're now in the middle of the current day of Brahma. So it's 4,320,000,000 years long. So that means it began a little over 2 billion years ago, billion with a B. And that means as a Vedic archaeologist, I would expect to see evidence for a human presence going back a couple of billion years. Now, it's interesting that the ancient Vedic teachings say that over that period of time, there have been six major devastations after which the earth has had to be repopulated. So it's kind of interesting. There's some interesting parallels with what modern geology tells us about the history of life on earth. Uh, modern geologists would say the first really identifiable uh, identifiable life forms that appear in the fossil record appear a couple of billion years ago. You know, before that, they can detect chemical signs of life, some questionable single-celled kinds of organisms. But basically, they say the first real clear signs of organisms go back a couple billion years. And since that time, they say there have been six major extinction events uh, spaced at intervals of several hundred million years. So it's kind of interesting that in the Vedic teachings, they speak of six devastations after which the earth has had to have been repopulated in modern science talks about six major extinction events, the last one being the one that wiped out the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago. So there are some interesting correspondences. Now, I know there are some people who favor a young age for the Earth, you know, 10,000 10,000 years or, or less, you know, based on their understanding of the Bible, for example. But I found some common ground with such people. And, you know, some of the organizations that uh, support that young earth idea have nevertheless had some very favorable things to say about my book, Forbidden Archaeology. And what I tell them is, you know, whether we think the earth is a few thousand or a few billion years old, humans have been around since the beginning. We did not evolve from apes. So at least we can agree on that much. And then we can later have some discussions about how old the, uh, the Earth is in terms of solar, solar years. And as far as you're mentioning uh, the idea that in some of the biblical accounts, there are descriptions of people living 900 or 1,000 years, 
It's interesting that a similar idea is also found in the Vedic teachings. They speak of a cycle of ages. And in the previous age, you know, in this age, people live a maximum of 100 years or so. In the previous age, people lived for a maximum of 1,000 years. And before that, there was another age where people lived for 10,000 years. It's, it's something that we find in a lot of the different ancient wisdom traditions that in previous ages, people lived for longer periods of time or were of larger size even. Gets you into a whole whole bunch of interesting topics. Well, you touched on a couple of things that I, I want to just go over. Um, first, I, I get, I mean, you mentioned that, you know, that we, that we didn't evolve from monkeys. As far as I understand, uh, the, the idea or the concept or the theory of evolution does not put humans as evolving from apes or evolving from, from monkeys. It's that we share a common ancestor with apes and with monkeys uh but that's perhaps for another debate or another discussion uh, what interests me more than anything is the the time scale of the culpa and it, i'm glad you brought that up because i have a note and and it's one of the questions and one of the things i wanted to go over with you uh this the day and night of brahma uh, otherwise known as the culpa which is four billion uh 320 million years old uh, um <laughs> I, I do a lot of research into a lot of different areas, and that number to me stuck out as not only an enormous number, but it's remarkably, remarkably um, accurate or, or, or specific because the number 432 is, uh, as a, myself, I'm a musician, and we, we typically, I'm a guitar player, so we typically will tune the A note uh, on the uh, on the guitar or even the piano at uh, 440 hertz, which is the frequency for the A note. Um, but through some various researches that I've done, I've come to understand that 432 is the original A note. And um, so when you say 4,320,000,000 years old, I see that as a base 432. It, it, does, that, does that ring any bells with you in, in terms of like vibrations and frequencies and things like that? Uh, yeah, I'm not primarily um, a musician, so I can't really speak with very much authority about it, but it. It, it wouldn't surprise me that there are connections between these numbers and different kinds of vibration and sound because according to the Vedic cosmology, everything ultimately comes from sound. Sound creates things, sound destroys them. Uh, it's kind of connected with the importance of mantras, which are concentrated sound vibrations. So it wouldn't surprise me that those who are expert in sound might detect connections between the frequencies and vibrations of different kinds of sounds and the structures that are there, phys the physical and temporal structure of the cosmos. Well, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the science of cymatics, uh, where uh, basically there are demonstrations and experiments that are done that show how various sound frequencies have a, a direct effect on the uh, matter. And so what they'll do is they'll like, They'll pour salt, for instance, as a particulate medium. Uh, they'll pour it onto a plate, and then they'll 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 activate that that plate with a particular sound frequency, and then the salt uh, automatically sort of jumps into these 
beautiful and symmetrical patterns according to specific frequencies. And in this study of cymatics, uh, the frequency 440, which is the common A note, um, it does create some kind of a pattern, but it's not very specific. But when you get to the 432 frequency, then the, fre then the pattern becomes very beautiful, very symmetrical. And so that's why I was, you know, trying to bring up the idea of the, the base 432 as related to the culpa being 400 or 4 billion, 320 million years old. Um, it also struck me uh, rather interesting. There's another time scale that even dwarfs the culpa. This is the time, in, I'm sure you're probably familiar, um, Vishnu, the, 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 the idea or the mythology of Vishnu sleeping and breathing in and out uh, multiple universes with every breath on time scales on the order of um, 311 trillion with a T trillion years. So again, not only is this is an enormous, enormous number, but I find it oddly specific that 311 trillion years. First question, are you familiar with what I'm talking about with on this time scale of Vishnu? And second, how on earth would any people with numbers like this? Yes, I, I am very familiar with uh, the breaths of Mahavishnu adding up to 311 trillion 40 billion years. And the way that you get that is you take the Kalpa or the day of Brahma, which lasts for 4 billion 320 million years, you combine that with a night of Brahma, which gives you 8,640,000 years, or excuse me, 8,640,000,000 years. And then you, you multiply that by 30, which is a month of Brahma. Uh, you know, the complete, you know, just like we have, you know, a, a day and a night is actually the complete day. So to get a complete day of Brahma, you have to add the day and the night. Right. Comes to 8,640,000,000. To get the month, you multiply that by 30. You multiply the month by 12, you get a year of Brahma. You multiply that by 100, you get the life of Brahma. Brahma is the demigod who manifests a universe, but he exists only for one breath of Mahavishnu. The Mahavishnu is lying on the causal ocean. When the Mahavishnu breathes out, universes emerge from his body, from the pores of the skin of his body. They come out in seed form, and then they're energized, and they expand. And then when the Mahavishnu breathes in, the universes are reabsorbed into his body. And Brahma exists in the universe for the length of that breath, in and out. So as you were mentioning, that's 311 trillion, 40 billion of our solar years. And this is mentioned in ancient Sanskrit texts like the Bhagavad Purana, that are thousands and thousands of years old. But modern science has just very recently come to the conclusion that there are apparently many universes. And of course, they have the idea of expanding and contracting universes. But these things were known to the Vedic sages 
millions and millions of years ago. So it's kind of interesting, some interesting parallels between what modern astrophysicists are theorizing and what these ancient Sanskrit writings are saying. Carl Sagan, who was an astronomer, he... Big, big fan. Yeah, he said in one of his... He had a famous television series, I think it was called Cosmos or something like that, where he yep. said where he said that among the various ancient cultures in the world, the Vedic culture of India had the time scales that are most compatible with modern scientific thinking. You know, he said that in one of his shows, I think, where he went to India and was examining some of the cosmological ideas that are expressed in these ancient writings. Well, I'm I'm a little surprised. Um, I did this while you were explaining all that just now. Um, I basically just I grabbed my phone with my calculator and I just I dropped all the 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 the, the preceding uh, or the subsequent zeros, and I basically I just divided three hundred and eleven zero four zero, which would be the three hundred eleven trillion. 40 billion year time scale of Vishnu. I divided that by 432, which is the base 432 for the Kulpa. Uh, when I divide 311040 by 432, it gives me exactly 720. And to me, I find that remarkable because uh, 72 is the number of years for the Earth's wobble to complete one degree of precession. And I think you're probably familiar with what I'm talking about. Yeah. So it seems that those numbers are perfectly in line with um, our the Earth's axial tilt uh, according to the precession of our equinox, I mean, uh, um, our, our constellation precession, the 25,920-year cycle of our precession. So. Yeah, another interesting place where this 432 comes in is the Yuga cycle. You know, we've been talking about uh, the Kalpa, which is a large cycle. There's a smaller cycle uh, called the Yuga cycle. Uh, a Kalpa is made up of uh, a thousand chatur yugas they're called cycle of four yugas so the cycle is composed of four yugas the satya yuga the treta yuga the dwapara yuga and the kali yuga which is the age we're in now the kali yuga according to the traditional understanding is 432 thousand years long and the Dwapara Yuga is twice that 864,000 the Treta Yuga is three times a Kali Yuga three times 432,000 and a Satya Yuga is four times 432,000. So the, the, the yugas are multiples of 432. I don't know if you were aware of that. No, I'm not. Um, I also understand that 432 is built into the Great Pyramid at Giza. I think 432 is built into Stonehenge and also at the uh, Teotihuacan in Mexico and some other monuments around the world that I'm forgetting off the top of my head. But uh, 432 seems to be uh, a pretty important number. And as I mentioned, it, it is the original A note. And I'm from, again, if I'm not mistaken, I think 432 is directly associated with the speed of light. Uh, I hope I'm not wrong on that one, but somewhere in my memory tells me that that's the case. Yeah, interesting. 
Okay, so um, so basically, these gigantic time scales you're you're talking about. It's basically it's a matter of uh, mathematics, uh, starting with these base numbers. Um, you know, like I said a minute ago, the the seventy two is what comes up when I divide three eleven zero four zero with four thirty two. I get I get seven. 20 which is a base 72 which is the the number of years for one degree of of um, procession um, and this from what I understand is also the the source of the 72 virgins that um, Islamists believe that they'll get when they martyr themselves and I think if I'm not mistaken there's 72 rungs on Jacob's ladder and if and I think there's 72 beads on a rosary bead um, things like that. So these numbers are all associated with the uh, the Earth-Sun relationship. Yes, or I mean, what do you know about that? Uh, I don't know that much about that. I'm not primarily a numerologist, but you know, things come to my attention, and I think about them. But I have to say on, on that topic, you'd have to educate me about it or I'd have to find out some other way, that particular topic. Is I'm always ready to admit there's, I don't know everything. Yeah. Yeah. I've got my limited sphere of knowledge. Fair enough, fair enough. So um, on the topic of, of Krishna, for instance, is Krishna not a solar deity? Uh, is Krishna, Krishna is considered a solar deity, is that correct? Not in the tradition. In a sense, there's... You know, there is a solar deity... That is an expansion of Krishna, according to the tradition. According to the line of teaching that I'm representing, there's an original source of everything that is conscious, it's personal, ever-existing. That original source of everything including the universes, the Mahavishnus, the Brahmas, the different celestial bodies within the universes, including the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets. It's all coming from some ultimate source. And that ultimate source is known by the name Krish Krishna. Uh... Yeah, I had to fix. Uh, the plug came out of my computer and it was starting to run down its battery. No but uh, it's fixed now. So, so Krishna existed before there was any sun or moon or any other celestial body. When the material universes are manifested, and there are many of them, you know, we were talking about the Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu is an expansion of Krishna for the purpose of manifesting the material universes. And the reason that the material universes exist is that there are some conscious selves, some souls that aren't qualified to exist on the purely spiritual level of reality where the ruling principle is loving, harmonious cooperation. Uh, there are certain conscious selves who by misuse of their free will have become selfish, domineering, controlling, exploiting. They can't exist on that higher spiritual level of reality. So there have to be 
alternative virtual reality systems for them to exist in and act out their desires and also be given the opportunity to qualify themselves to come back to that higher level of reality. That's what the material universes are. And they, as you were mentioning, come from the body of the Mahavishnu, who is kind of sleeping and dreaming, breathing in and out. And as he breathes out, the universes emerge from the pores of the skin of his form. And when he breathes in, they come back in to his body. When they're out, in each one of them, there's a solar system, a sun, and Krishna expands into the sun as a form called Surya Narayan. And, you know, there are mantras dedicated to the meditation upon Krishna in his form as Surya Narayan, the form of God within the sun. But that's an expansion of Krishna. You know, just like you might have, you know, the, the president of a country, he's got the executive power, and then he expands that executive power into the different secretaries and officials that he or she appoints. Uh, they're manifestations of the presidential authority. So in the same way, yes, there is Surya Narayan, who's an expansion of the presidential or authority of Krishna, you could say, who is the ultimate source of everything. So I don't know if I don't know if that makes sense, but I'm trying to. Well, I'm I'm I'm, absor I'm absorbing as we go. Um, I I just I I do a fair amount of research into. Uh, various ancient uh, religions and cultures, um, including Christianity. And it seems to me that Krishna, uh, from what I have come to understand, is the source or origin of the Christ or Christos, the Christ consciousness, the Christos, the Krishna. Um, now, is it is it not true that Krishna was born of the virgin um, Devaki? Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Was Krishna not crucified? Uh, not that I, I haven't seen anything like that. Um, I've got a file here I might want to share with you. In fact, I, I, let me just go ahead and do that. Um, Give me just one second. I want to show you a couple of things that I have here. And you can speak to them or tell me where I'm wrong or where or this information is incorrect if, if you know something about it. But um, here's just a couple of things I want to share with you. Um, that um, uh, Vishnu, Brahma, and Shiva are all the sun. This is just one of several things that I want to share with you. The sun at night... And in the west is Vishnu. He is Brahma in the east. And in the morning, from noon to evening, he is Siva. The three gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Siva, form what is called uh, the Triumvedi, or the, uh, the Hindu triad. These three gods are regarded as the same deity. Yes or no? True or false, Michael Cremo? Uh, false. <clears throat> uh, I, I notice the author is John... John Bates. Uh, yeah, this is the what I would call the importance of being initiated into the system of knowledge that comes directly from Krishna and to take uh, the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, which was spoken by Krishna himself, as a source of knowledge. Now, the 
the author isn't completely wrong, but it often happens that people coming from outside a tradition, from a different perspective, may, in their understandings, get things not quite right. There's some truth to what the author says, but uh, if you look in Bhagavad Gita, which is regarded as a very authoritative text in the tradition, uh, you find, if you look at Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, and here I'll say I'm representing the tradition as I've received it, that Vishnu is an expansion of Krishna. Krishna is the ultimate source of everything. And Vishnu is the expansion of Krishna for maintaining order in the material universe. And you know, even Vishnu is a complicated term because there's Maha Vishnu from whom all the material universes expand. And then there's a form of Vishnu that enters into each universe called the Garbhadakshai Vishnu. And then there's a form of Vishnu that enters into the hearts of all living things and is present even within the atom. And that is the Chiradakshai Vishnu. And Vishnu in all of those three forms is a form of God, like a plenary expansion of God on the same level as Krishna. Brahma is a demigod. He's not on the same level. He's a demigod who's given the responsibility in each universe of manifesting the different planetary systems and the different kinds of material bodies that souls will occupy in each universe. And so you could say he's uh, an engineering subordinate of Vishnu. And Shiva is empowered to destroy the universal manifestation when it's time to do that. So Shiva is also in the demigod category like Brahma, according to the tradition as I understand it and received it through the teachings of the disciplic succession and the Bhagavad Gita. So I would say the quote that you gave by the author Bates is partially true, but not completely true. Okay, so Vishnu seems to be a lot more uh, in depth than is obviously described in this this quotation here. Yes. Uh, so it's well, let me, not that not that it's completely untrue, but as I said, people who aren't really part of the tradition when they look at it, you know, they they may not absorb it entirely correctly. But I think it's good he's talking about Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, and he's because they exist, and ultimately he's right. They're all part of the same deity, but they're not equal parts. Um, okay, well, it seems from not only this particular piece of artwork, but many or most artworks of these uh, deities, uh, of the Hindu and, and Vedic deities that I've looked at, 
Um, like for instance, here in the center, we have, uh, um, we've got Brahma here in the center, which apparently is circled by a golden uh, circle and it's surrounded by clouds, which to me screams in, in a symbolic manner, it screams that this is a solar deity that you know travels through the clouds. Um, it seems to make sense to me on, on certain level that these three deities being a trinity, just as in Christianity, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost type trinity, that most other uh, ancient cultures and ancient religions have their own version of the trinity, which uh, almost always reflect back to the sun, and, and in this case being the morning sun, the high noon sun, and then the evening or the setting sun. Um, so uh, one one question that really stands well, out. Well, I, I, I think I think it's legitimate to try to make comparisons among you know what's revealed in different traditions. And actually the center figure there, the one that's surrounded by the halo is Vishnu and Brahma is seated on the lotus to the left and Shiva to the to the right. Now as I said, one form of Vishnu is a solar deity, Surya Narayan. So you wouldn't be entirely incorrect in saying, in a general way, Vishnu could be considered a solar deity because, I mean, according to the tradition, one of his expansions, Surya Narayan, is situated within the sun and is providing and is ultimately providing the energy for it so, and in bhagavad gita krishna says uh he's the light of the sun and the moon you know so it's it's not entirely incorrect to say as you're doing neither is it is it something that I object to that you look with par look for parallels among you know different traditions? You know, okay. Well, here's yeah, a so I, I'm not okay. Okay, saying okay. that it's complete. In, in my book, Human Devolution, I've got a section on cross cultural study of cosmologies where I look at the cosmologies of 30 different cultures widely spread in time and space. And I note the parallels among them all. So I think you've obviously done the same sort of research. You know, you're looking for parallels among, you know, the different cultures. And I think that's a legitimate thing to do. Okay, um, uh, just as a side note, um, just a, a question that I've always had every single time I ever look at um, Vedic or Hindu deities in this manner, as you can see from this particular image um, that uh, Vishnu and Shiva are bluish gray, sometimes they're dark blue, sometimes they're aqua marine or a little bit greenish. So I guess can you answer for me why are so many of the Hindu deities like Vishnu, Shiva, Kali, uh, and sometimes Brahma, why are they uh, usually or often or sometimes depicted as blue? Why, why the blue color? Um, because that is how they are described in the text and by realized persons who have perceived them in trance or directly. So it's just the way they are. Now, I, you know, I was just reading a, a description of that. It said the, the actual 
color is just indescribable, but it it corresponds to roughly what we would call that bluish color. You know, the color sometimes it's described as the color of a monsoon cloud. You know, sometimes you see when storm clouds are coming, they're a dark bluish black color, very radiant somehow. So it's just described that that is. Yeah, sometimes the Kali. Color. Sometimes Kali is depicted as black, and Kali is the destroyer. Is that right? Yes. Okay. A, con a consort of Shiva. Oh, a consort of Shiva. Okay, so all uh, from this particular artwork that we're looking at right here, um, all three of these figures appear to be, I, I want to say hermaphroditic. They look female in the face. Um, Brahma sitting on the lotus looks to be definitely female. Um, and then uh, Vishnu has sort of an Af uh, hermaphroditic appearance and, and Shiva certainly has a hermaphroditic, has a, ma a masculine body with a feminine face. Uh, can you speak to this concept? Uh, because this is not the first time I've seen this uh, in, in various deities and other cultures that seem to have the, me the masculine and feminine aspect built into their artworks. Their, their, well, you know, their transcriptions, their carvings, their paintings, their, their relief carvings, these types of things. Yeah, I think we have to keep in mind the different kinds of artistic sensibilities there are in different cultures. Sure. Because uh, according to, say, Western standards, if you look at Renaissance art and things like that, they were very much into dissecting bodies, looking at the skeleton, looking at the muscles. You know, if you look at, you know, some of the great artists like Michelangelo and, you know, the people like that, they were, they were engaged in anatomical studies, looking at bone structure and trying to get the bones and the muscles and everything very anatomically accurate. But according to the Vedic conceptions of art, a different standard is applied because according to the Vedic system of thought, these gods and demigods like Vishnu and Brahma and Shiva don't have bones and muscles and, and veins and all the stuff that we're used to seeing. So the there are Vedic literatures that give instruction how these figures are to be depicted. And, you know, if you try to imagine a form, you know, a bodily form without muscles, without bones, without, you know, the things that are usually depicted, you know, therefore you're going to see a more rounded face, you know, without you know, highly visible cheekbones and muscle structure. There are feminine deities in the Vedic cosmology, and you'll see them sometimes depicted with their male consorts or counterparts, like... Uh, Krishna has a feminine counterpart, Radha, 
and they are considered both together to be uh, God. So God exists in both male and female aspect, and sometimes they're depicted side by side. But Krishna or Vishnu would still appear as painted in the picture that you showed because it's a different conception of what the bodily form is. It's considered to be, you know, that depiction of the male form of Vishnu or Shiva or Brahma. It looks different than what you would get from a Western realistic kind of painting of a male form, even of a even the Greeks, you know, in their depictions of the demigods. You know, if you look at Greek statues, you know, they they show the bone structure, the muscular structure in a very anatomically realistic way because their conception of even demigods and gods and goddesses was like that. In the Vedic system of art, it's not exactly like that. They're depicted according to a different standard as if they didn't have you know, the bones and the same kind of muscle structure. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay, Michael Cremo, true or false? Krishna was born of a miraculous conception. Yes. Wise men were able to come because they were guided by a star. Uh, that I'm not exactly sure of, but wise men and wise deities of a supernatural type did come but okay. go ahead so so partially partially true okay true or false after he was born an area ruler tried to have him found and killed yes true or false his parents were warned by a divine messenger and they escaped uh not entirely true, uh, but in some sense, yes. So I'll give that a partially true. Okay. True or false, they were met by shepherds. Cowherds. So partially true. Cowherds. Okay. Did you say, did you say cow as in C-O-W or chow? Cow, C O W. Okay, cow herders. Okay. Uh, true or false, the boy grew up to be a mediator between God and man. Partially true. Okay. Now, does this story sound familiar to you? I think there are, there are similarities with some of the things that you find in the New Testament. Right. Thank you. That's, that's pretty much where I was going with that. As I had mentioned earlier, Krishna is, um, from what I understood, to be the Christ, the Christos, the Christ consciousness. Um, here's a, from an unknown source, I don't know where I got this here. Um, uh, the Hindus had worshipped him, meaning Krishna, from ancient times, the baby Krishna in the arms of the Virgin Devakti, as the Roman Catholic worshipped Madonna with the baby Christ. So the, again, there's, an, there's the parallel there. So Krishna was born of the Virgin Devakti, yes? Ye yes, that's a fact. Okay. And let's see. Krishna um, represents the supreme manifestation of God and has been incarnated many times in history, including the Rama and the Buddha. And most recently has come as Chitanam uh, Mahaprabhu. Is that correct? Ye yes. And I, I'd like to you know, focus on that. As I said, okay. originally 
you know, the understanding through the tradition is that Krishna is the original personality of Godhead, the source of everything, and expands into different avatars like Rama, Chaitanya, who you mentioned. Yeah, I yes. just pronounced it poorly. <laughs> no, a absolutely. That, that I can say, is 100% correct. Okay, so as I had mentioned or alluded to that we're, what we're talking about might very well be solar deities or at the very least that they're represented as solar deities. I have, I have here another um, clip of the uh, Buddha, true or false? One of the disciples was his favorite and another it was his traitor. Well, I'm not a member of the Buddhist tradition, so I can't really speak with authority about a lot of these things. That, I just have to say, I don't know. Okay, okay. so now I'm really curious because you confirm that Krishna has been reincarnated uh, through various avatars. Um, not, like, not reincarnated, expanded. Or, Okay. Okay. Yes. Like, you know, from incarnated. Okay, so in from. It's not that Krishna. You know, if I reincarnate as somebody, that means, you know, I if I expand myself into another form, so that I continue to exist on my own, and I'm able to manifest another form, that's more or less what happens with Krishna. He remains as he is, but is able to manifest different forms while still maintaining his own identity. Okay. I mean, re reincarnation means I die, I become somebody sure. else. Sure. It's, it's, it's not like that. It, 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 it's sure. pardon some, me. something else. Yeah, pardon me. I, I meant to say incarnated, as you as you mentioned, expanded into. Um, so if, if Krishna can incarnate or expand or become uh, the Rama, the, the Chaitanya, uh, and or the Buddha. as Yes, um, absolutely. So, but you're not... So you're familiar with these concepts, but you're not. From, but what? What? Where's the? Where is the cutoff here? Because you said that you don't know much about Buddha, as in the Buddhism, the tradition of Buddhism. I. Where's the there? If Krishna can I, become Buddha, how is it that 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 you're so unfamiliar with this? You know. Well, what I mean? I'm not. I know something about Buddha. I don't know about all of his disciples okay yeah you know, i know that buddha came to teach ahimsa <laughs> non-violence that he's an expansion of krishna you know I, I i know some things but i'm just uh okay. being honest about the sure. limits of my knowledge about i i don't know all the details of his relationships with his different disciples. Okay. All right. Well, I can just say, I, I'm not saying it's not, I just don't know. I can't. That's totally fine. I, that's fine. I'm just trying to get whatever answers I can and whatever you know about it. And yeah, and just answer honestly. And that's totally fine. Um, nobody's going to hold your feet to any fire here. Um, so one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, as I've already mentioned, that the concept that these deities are solar deities, um, and pardon me, uh, the deification of the planets, this excerpt here comes from uh, Emanuel Velikovsky. Um, now, I've ordered his book. I'm still waiting for it to be delivered. It should have been here already. Um, but I just want to read this to you uh, quickly here. It says, the sun and the moon were two great luminaries. It was easily understandable that the imagination of the people should 
be preoccupied with them and should ascribe to them mythological deeds. Yet the ancient mythologies of the Chaldeans, the Greeks, the Romans, the Hindus, the Mayans preoccupy themselves not with the sun or the moon, but prima facie with the planets. Uh, Marduk, the great god of the Babylonians, was the planet Jupiter. So was Amon of the Egyptians, Zeus of the Greeks, and Jupiter of the Romans. It was much superior to Shamash Helios, the sun. Uh, why was it revered by all peoples? Why was the planet Mars chosen to be the personification of the god of war? Why did Kronos of the Greeks and Saturn of the Romans play such a part in hundreds of myths and legends? Thoth of the Egyptians, Nebo and Nigral of the Babylonians, and Mithra and Mazda of the Persians, and here it comes, ready? Vishnu and Shiva of the Hindus. And uh, I'm not even going to try, I'm going to butcher this one here. Huitzilopochtli -po 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 and Quetzalcoatl of the Mexicans uh, were personifications of the planets. Innumerable hymns were dedicated to them and ventures exploits ascribed to them. So according to Emanuel Velikovsky, and I think this was written around uh, 1950, um, but he says here that Vishnu and Shiva of the Hindus were basically another name for the planet um, uh, Mars. Or excuse me, uh, maybe, pardon me, did I read that wrong? It's Saturn. Why did Kronos of the Greeks, Saturn, uh, Thoth of the Egyptians, uh, Mithra, Mazda, Persnu, Vishnu of Shiva. Um, yeah, so uh, according to Emmanuel Velikovsky here, he names Vishnu and Shiva uh, of the Hindu tradition, uh, basically representing the planet Saturn. Uh, Does that mean anything to you? Does that resonate no, with you? No, I, I don't see any justification for that. And the tradition itself, I, I really don't see any evidence for that. When you look at the tradition itself, you know, Vishnu would have existed before there was a, a universe with those planets in it. Okay. I mean, there are, I mean, there are, I mean, traditionally down through history, there have been different ways that people have tried to deal with the concept of God or gods and goddesses. One of them is to accept them for what they are. The other is to try to explain them as personifications of natural phenomena be they planets or or whatever and i guess you know my current position is that there to be at least the vedic ones that i'm familiar with brahma vishnu shiva krishna all of the those i accept them as they're depicted in the tradition itself and its textual sources, which means, you know, I would see Vishnu as the source of all the universes who was existing before there were any material universes or planets or suns. You know, it's a... Uh, different way of looking at things. Of course, in that view, they'd be transformations of his different energies. He'd be the source of them and in one sense be one with them, but simultaneously different. Like a, an artist can make with his energies a sculpture or a painting, and in one sense, can be identified with them. They're his, they're his creation, but at the same time, he's different from them and is their source. Okay, um, so I've got some co-hosts here and I'm wondering if they have any questions for our guest here tonight so far. 
Amy, Gandalf, you guys want to pipe up? Have I been hogging the microphone or what? Well, my problem is my PC. Okay. Yeah, Amy's Amy's got pro her. her. I don't even know if you can hear me answering. No, Amy, I'm sorry. I don't I don't mean to cut you off, but you're breaking up terrible as as usual. She has a an older computer, and when we do these live streams, that it gobbles up her CPU, and sometimes she gets a good connection, and sometimes she doesn't. Gandalf, are you with us? Uh, yeah, I'd like to ask uh, how you got involved with doing the documentary that you did back in 1996, I think it was, with Charlton Heston. Oh, well, there was, that was a, a couple of years after my book, Forbidden Archaeology, was published. And the book got into the hands of a lady named Jean Hunt who was president of an organization called the Louisiana Mound Society. In other words, she was into alternative archaeology, and she'd gotten a copy of my book. And she was uh, a Southern lady, and she called me on the phone once, and she said, you know, Michael, I've got a copy of your book, Forbidden Archaeology, and I think it's just wonderful. I've really enjoyed it. And I think you should send a copy of it to a friend of mine, a television producer in New York. Uh, his name is Bill Cote. So I got the contact information from Gene Hunt, who's since left this world. But uh, at that time, you know, I, I sent a copy of Forbidden Archaeology to Bill Cote, who had produced a special for NBC called The Mystery of the Sphinx, where, you know, he had talked to a lot of pyramid researchers and Egyptologists about the Sphinx. And he was planning to do another documentary, hopefully, he said, for NBC. And he was going to call it The Mysterious Origins of Man. And he, you know, he, 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 he got in touch with me and said, okay, I've got your book. The evidence in it is really interesting. I, I think it would fit in this documentary I'm doing called The Mysterious Origins of Man. So at that time, myself and my co-author, Richard Thompson, were living in Florida, and Bill Cote came down with his crew and he interviewed us about the book. And I also mentioned to him uh, the California gold mine discoveries. You know, he, in, in the 19th century, gold was discovered in California and miners went to get it and they were digging tunnels into the sides of mountains in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And deep inside the tunnels, they were finding human bones and human artifacts. And these came to the attention of the state geologist of California, Dr. J.D. Whitney. And he wrote a massive report about them you know, these things were found in layers of rock about 50 million years old. You know, these human bones and human artifacts. Now, some of them are still in the collection of the Museum of Anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley. So I told Bill Cote about that. So he went out there and tried to film them, but the museum officials would not give him 
permission to do that. So he wasn't able to uh, get any new footage, but we were able to find some of the photographs that Dr. Whitney had taken of the artifacts in uh, the 19th century. So he was able to use those for his uh, video. I also told him about the work of Virginia Steen McIntyre, who's an American geologist who was involved in dating an archaeological site in Mexico at a place called Huayatlaco. You know, some archaeologist, American archaeologist, had uncovered stone tools and weapons there, and they wanted to know how old they were. So they called in a team of geologists to date the site. And Virginia Steen McIntyre and her colleagues used several of the latest scientific methods to date the site. And they got an age of about 300,000 years. And the archaeologists refused to publish that age because, you know, they said that's impossible. Humans capable of making the artifacts we found there didn't exist 300,000 years ago. So. And she lost her position in the end, didn't she? Yeah, she did. She experienced a very negative, extreme backlash from her colleagues in the scientific world because she was going to publish an age that so radically contradicted the dominant theories. So Bill Cote went and interviewed her and they went down to Mexico and visited the site. And, you know, Bill Cote also included other researchers in his documentary like uh, Graham Hancock and John Anthony West and Robert Schock, all of, of whom have done archaeological research that in one way or another contradicts the dominant theories, either about Egypt or Ethiopia or other places. So it was really interesting. He, he, he put together this documentary called The Mysterious Origins of Man that kind of featured my work and the work of other researchers in alternative history. And when scientists learned that NBC was going to broadcast this documentary on Sunday evening in prime time, when many young children would still be up and watching TV, they were just shocked. And they began a campaign to try to convince NBC not to show it. NBC did show it. It was very popular. As uh, you were mentioning, it was hosted by Charlton Heston. And you know, then there was outrage from the scientific community. They were very upset that a major network like NBC would show something that contradicted what they were trying to teach children in the education system, which they completely control. So they began a campaign to try to boycott the sponsors of the show. And they uh, had a campaign to try to convince the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, to uh, fine NBC millions of dollars oh, for having shown the documentary. And they also wanted the FCC to force NBC to issue a public apology for having shown the documentary. Now, they didn't do that. The FCC 
didn't do that, but I thought it was really kind of interesting that these sorts of attempts were were being made. You know, it's uh, so that mysterious origins of man. It's still available on DVD or online somewhere. Yeah, I originally found that on YouTube probably back in 2008. Yeah. And that's where I first found out about you all those years ago. Um, I was just going to ask, uh, doesn't it doesn't it validate uh, your work, specifically the findings at Gobekli Tepe, because particularly uh, Robert Schock, he was uh, uh, he was at the point where he was believing that the Sphinx was roughly ten thousand years old. And Gobekli Tepe, which was found in southern Turkey, that matches up to around 10,000 years old. And, you know, all hi history books should be rewritten that uh, human history goes back at not to 6,000 years ago around Sumer, but goes back 6,000 years before that. But they don't seem to have updated any of the uh, textbooks that that's the true beginnings of human culture and civilization. Yeah. Uh, yeah, alternative history is a, a big field. And, you know, some researchers are dealing with the more recent end of the time spectrum like you were saying most historians and archaeologists today think that the very first simple village life began about 10,000 years ago and they think the first urban civilizations like the Sumerians and that kind of group began, as you said, about six or 7,000 years ago. So the Gobekli Tepe site, which includes many monumental stone structures with very elaborate carvings of animals and human beings on them, that dates back to about 13,000 years ago. So some researchers are dealing with that end of the time spectrum, trying to push the origin of civilization further and further back in time, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 years. And, and I find that very interesting, and I support that work, and I'm very happy to endorse it. My own personal research is dealing with uh, what you might call deep time, going back millions of years, you know, even hundreds of millions of years, looking for evidence, any evidence of a human presence uh, back in deep time. So do you believe that it were it was separate evolutions of mankind that took place over the six major extinction events that have happened? Well, according to the Vedic cosmology, the entire universe is inhabited and it's not just extraterrestrial humans, it's more like extra dimensional humans. And an important thing to understand about the Vedic cosmology is that any kind of body, whether it's a human body or a plant body or an animal body, is a vehicle for a conscious self, a soul that is totally non-material. So there are certain personalities in the Vedic cosmos called prajapatis. They're generators of population. They're generators of the bodies that serve as vehicles for souls on our level of reality. And they exist on a slightly higher level of the cosmos so that when there's a devastation that wipes out 
life on Earth, they are able to repopulate the Earth from higher levels of reality and reintroduce the different kinds of plant, animal, and human bodily bodies that will serve as vehicles for the conscious selves, the souls that come to this earthly level of reality. So it's something like cloud computing. You know, many people today, they keep all their files, their songs, their pictures on, on, the, on the cloud, in the cloud, so that if their device gets destroyed or malfunction, you know, they can always download all their files from the cloud. So oh. the, the cosmos appears to be set up kind of like that so that these projopities, these gener generators of bodies, they're always there so that after the periodic devastations that take place on our level of reality, they're able to, again, provide the bodily vehicles, including the human ones, Okay, so basically, I'm pretty familiar with parallel realities, uh, alternate dimensions and whatnot. So basically, uh, humankind or human civilization simply or our, our race basically vibrates back into this dimension or this reality. Yeah, that's okay. a good way to put it. Okay, that's a fascinating concept of being able to uh, explain why after every major extinction, humans reappear. It's part of the plan. The, the, you know, just like, you know, like certain computer companies like Dell, you know, they've got the parts and the plans for all the kinds of computer systems, but they don't actually build them until somebody orders it. Then when somebody orders it, they build it and they ship it. You know, they can if they don't get any orders, they don't ship. So, but the plan, but the plan still fits there. Yeah, the plan is still there. The parts are still there. When there's a need for it, it it can be done. So, the plan for the human form, the parts needed to construct it, are there on this higher dimension or higher level of reality so that when there's a need for them to be manifested, they are. Okay, I, I'm 100% I'm on board with this. Um, what's your opinion on the uh, Paluxy Riverbed uh, footprints? Well, and I was aware of them when I was doing the research for my book, Forbidden Archaeology, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And I did not include them in my book because the scientist who originally was promoting them uh, withdrew his claims. I think it was Dr. Henry Morris Jr., if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you know, he's a, a young earth Christian creationist, but I have respect for them. But he, you know, at the Paluxy River, what they have is dinosaur footprints, which everybody accepts. But alongside them are other footprints that look in some ways like modern human footprints and the very same layers of rock, which are about 120 million years old from the time of the dinosaurs. So some researchers were promoting this as evidence that humans coexisted with dinosaurs. But when they were challenged, some of these researchers said, okay, uh, these look like human footprints, but really they're dinosaur 
tracks that have been eroded so that they look sort of like human footprints. So on that basis, you know, because the, the scientist that was originally making the claims that they were human footprints withdrew his claims, I kind of put that case aside for further study. After Forbidden Archaeology was published, I would sometimes get letters from archaeology students <clears throat> asking me if they could help with any research. So there was uh, an archaeology student from Texas that, excuse me, I'm going to take a little sip of water here. <clears throat> there was an archaeology student from Texas who asked if she could do something. <clears throat> and I told her, you could go to this Paluxy River site and see what you think of those footprints. So she went there, and there was a group of uh, biblical creationist researchers who were doing more excavations there, trying to uncover more footprints. And she participated in those excavations. And she sent back to me some of her own firsthand personal observations. And as a graduate student of archaeology, she said it looks pretty convincing to me. So on that basis, I'm kind of prepared to give a new look at this evidence. And I'm prepared to say that, yes, it appears that some of the tracks there alongside the dinosaur tracks do appear to be human. And I'll include my discussion of this case in an upcoming book on evidence for extreme human antiquity that has come to my attention since the original book was published. Wow, it, it, it seems pretty compelling to me by looking at the photos. It doesn't seem like they were erosions of, uh, of, uh, of claws or something like that. They look like human footprints. Yeah, I, I think a, a, a good case can be made, and that's what I'm going to say in this upcoming book. When's that going to be coming out? Well, it takes me a long time to put books together because I like to do very, very thorough research. It took me eight years to do the research for Forbidden Archaeology, five years for my book, Human Devolution, a Vedic Alternative to Darwin's Theory. I wish I was one of these authors that could knock out a book every year. Uh, you know, I'm not criticizing that. I, I'm just saying, you know, maybe I'm being too careful and maybe too thorough in, in the research that I'm trying to do, but that's just the way that I operate. I would like to say it'll be out in the next few months, but that probably isn't really true, so I'm not going to say that. But eventually it will come out. But I do often write about things in my column, my regular column in Atlantis Rising magazine. So I may mention it in one of those columns. Are you familiar with the uh, new theories of Atlantis coming out of uh, Mauritania? Uh, I've heard a lot of different theories about where Atlantis is. I haven't 
heard the one specifically about Mauritania. I've heard about it being in South America, in Bolivia, on the Alta Plano, in the Atlantic Ocean, near the Azores, in the Atlantic Ocean, near Bermuda, in Indonesia, in the Mediterranean. You know, I've, I've, I'm not an Atlantis expert or researcher. I would just say I accept the general principle that in ancient times there were civilizations or settlements in various parts of the world that are now underwater because basically that's what's happened over the past 20,000 years or so as the ice caps have been melting this after the last ice age sea levels have been rising around the world you know covering populated areas and marine archaeology has become a, a actually quite a a, a a big discipline these days so the, on, on the general principle that there are inhabited areas of the world that are now underwater and that the populations that were once in these places have dispersed to other parts of the world, that general principle I accept. So what do you think of Yana Guni? Speaking of underwater archaeology, what do you what is your opinion on the uh, the discovery or the site uh, just off the coast of Japan known as Yanaguni? Well, it's it's a complicated topic because I mean I tend to think I would like to think they were real architectural remains that have gone under the water. I, I know there are other alternative history researchers like Robert Schock who have said, well, they, they may look artificial, they may look like architectural structures, but it's really just deposits of stone that have fractured into uh, hexagonal or quadrilateral shapes that look like architectural remains. Uh, we have a friend here on YouTube. He's been a guest on our show a couple of times, uh, Dr. Jo Charles Koss, and he researches many of the topics and, th and archaeological ancient things that we discuss here. Uh, one of the things that he found, and I, I found this to be really remarkable and striking, was uh, the similarity between the structure at Yanaguni and the various structures of of certain crystal, uh, of mineral deposits that, that become crystallized. And that he said that, um, I think it was a barium or something like that, that um, crystallized and looked very much like the terraced uh, formation at Yanaguni. So I just wanted to get your opinion on what you thought about that site. Yeah, I haven't looked deeply into that. You know, like I was explaining a, a little bit before in alternative history, some researchers are dealing with the more recent end of the time spectrum. And Yonaguni, even among its supporters, isn't considered to be really that old. You know, it's thousands of years old, according to them. Whereas in my research, I'm dealing more with deep time. I'm kind of aware of the Yona Guni research. I mean, once uh, Graham Hancock and his wife visited me in Los Angeles and they were on their way out there to Yonaguni to do some diving. And, you know, so I'm kind of aware, although, you know, I haven't looked deeply okay. into that particular case because it doesn't 
fit into my main area of research, which is archaeological evidence for extreme human antiquity. Okay, so let's talk about some of the evidence that you have come across. Like, for instance, you I know you've discussed this in your book and on many interviews, the uh, discovery at Table Mountain. And then uh, there's uh, the discovery at, um, there was, what is it, it was a coal mine in Africa, I think. Where the the trans the uh, the transvaal spheres, is that correct? Did I pronounce that pr properly? The, the transvaal spheres. Uh, yeah. Well, the Table Mountain discoveries I mentioned a little bit earlier in the show. Those date back to the California gold mine discoveries in the 19th century. Table Mountain is in the Sierra Nevada Mountains near Sonora in Tuolumne County in California. And during the gold rush days, miners were digging tunnels into the sides of mountains like Table Mountain. And in the tunnels, they were finding human bones and human artifacts in layers of rock that modern geologists tell us date back to the early part of the geological period called the Eocene, which means they'd be about 50 million years old. <clears throat> so these discoveries came to the attention of Dr. J.D. Whitney, who was the chief government geologist of California, <clears throat> he investigated these study, these cases, which came from not just from Table Mountain, but from many other places in the gold mining region. And he wrote a report about them that was published in, at Harvard University in the year 1880. But you know, we, we don't hear very much about these discoveries today because of the process of knowledge filtration. There was a contemporary of Dr. Whitney, a Dr. William Holmes, who was, <clears throat> excuse me, an anthropologist working at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. And he was a very prominent scientist at the time, more influential than Whitney. And uh, Dr. Holmes said, if Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of human evolution, he wouldn't have published that report. In other words, he should have known that humans could not have existed millions of years in the past. So that... <clears throat> that evidence shouldn't have been published. It, 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 it should simply have been forgotten, which is what actually happened. So what actually was, so what was actually found at Table Mountain? Uh, spear points made of obsidian, stone mortars and pestles, uh, a variety of other kind of stone tools and weapons, human bones. They were just literally hundreds of discoveries. And some of the artifacts are still in the collection of the Museum of Anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley. As I was mentioning, in 1996, when the television producer Bill Cote went there, you know, they kind of denied him permission to see or film the artifacts. But later, several years later, I went back there myself and I did get permission to see them. They're not displayed to the public. They're kept in a storage building some distance from the actual museum, but they are still there, and I've seen them. And I'll, I, again, this is a, a case I'll be discussing in an upcoming 
upcoming book. <laughs> why, why do you think there is such a refusal to uh, investigate this and to even talk about it? Uh, there's a... There's a guy from uh, Massachusetts, uh, Jim Vieira, who's uh, been investigating, looking into the discovery of giant's bones, and that these bones were discovered in the mounds all over uh, North America from the Mississippian culture that used to be all over Eastern North America. And they've always, they, they admitted uh, back in the 1800s that they were discovering these bones. People like Abraham Lincoln even mentioned these large uh, giant's bones being discovered but this is always uh, swept under the rug and there's always this refusal to talk about it even though it's widely known that these uh, artifacts and these remains exist yeah i've i've met jim vieira you know we were both speaking at the same conference it was held in london last year and I had a chance, we had some meals together, and I had a chance to talk about him and his work and his experience with a television series on the topic. And it really is fascinating. Uh, again, it's not a subject that's my main field of research, but I am interested in it because, in general, I accept the principle that in the past, living things, including human beings, were, were, were larger than they are today. You know, that's certainly part of the Vedic teaching. In the Puranas, it's described that before the age that we're in now, the Kali Yuga, which began about 5,000 years ago, before that time, the Puranas say human beings were <clears throat> of larger size than they are today. So just in principle, I'm prepared to accept that. <clears throat> the problem is it's a little difficult to find the actual bones themselves. There are, as you pointed out, and as Jim points out, many reports of such things. But when <clears throat> you try to track down the actual specimens, it's a little difficult. So can you just go over for us some of or just go through the various dating methods because i know this is a contentious issue with a lot of people particularly with carbon dating having its own issues with contamination and the limitations of I, I, what is it fifty thousand years is the maximum so can you just give us an idea of what are the different types of dating methods and and how reliable are they when and when it comes to like you know, a discovery like in Table Mountain, when you say 50 million years old, how do we know how reliable that is? And uh, go through the dating methods and, and break it down for some of us. Okay. Uh, first, I'll just make a, a general observation. You know, from, I've said this a number of times that my thoughts on these topics are, influenced by my studies in the ancient Vedic histories, which do speak about long cycles of time. You know, so I'm prepared to accept that there can be times involving millions of years. I'll just say that from, from the beginning. For someone who accepts a very, very young age for the whole earth or even the whole universe, they're going to have perhaps more problems with the dating methods than I, I might. It seems to me as a general principle, the dating methods are based on 
on on things that seem fairly reasonable, like the rates of decay of radioactive elements and things of that sort, or you know, the correlating dating by different radiometric methods with uh, tree rings and uh, the ice cores from Antarctica and things like that. But that said, each dating method has its limitations and can be mistaken. Let's take the radiocarbon method, carbon dating method that you were referring to. That's based on the idea that in living things, there are two types of carbon and one form of carbon, one isotope of carbon, carbon-12, is not radioactive. The other type of carbon found in living things, carbon-14, is radioactive. Being radioactive means it decays into other elements. So that means after a living thing died, the carbon-12 in it remains the same, but the carbon-14 will be decaying. And it decays at intervals called half-lives. The half-life of carbon-14 is roughly 5,000 years. So half-life means that if you have a certain amount of carbon-14, then after 5,000 years, you'll only have half of the amount remaining. Then after another 5,000 years, another half is gone. And then another half, another half. If you go back about 20 half-lives, there's no more carbon-14 left to be measured. Okay, so, so carbon-14 has a, a maximum range on which it can be accurate. About 100,000. Okay, that, yeah. About 100,000 years. Assuming there's no contamination of any sort in the sample. Right, and that's the problem. You know, contamination of samples. Let's say you have a human bone that in reality is 5 million years old. And then you carbon date it. Now, if there's been no contamination, what the carbon date will show is no datable carbon-14, which means that all you could say is it's over 100,000 years old. But if you've got the least amount of contamination with modern carbon-14, then it will show a falsely young age of less than 100,000 years, even though the bone is really 5 million years old. So that is a big problem with carbon dating. And a sample can become contaminated with modern carbon-14 in many ways. While the bone is in the ground, it can be contaminated with bacteria that enter it by minerals that enter it through flowing groundwater. When an archaeologist touches the bone, it can become contaminated with carbon-14 from his skin oils. If a bone is being kept in a museum and it's treated with 
organic preservatives. It can become contaminated with modern carbon-14. So sometimes you hear, oh, this bone was dated with carbon-14, but if it wasn't properly treated, if the contaminants weren't all removed, it could be giving a falsely young age. There, then there's another method called the uranium series method. It's based on the same principle that bones and other organic materials contain small amounts of uranium, which is radioactive, which means it decays into daughter elements. And by measuring the ratio of those daughter elements to the amount of uranium isotopes that are in the sample, you can get an age estimate for the bone. And this has limits too, up to a few hundred thousand years. And beyond that, there is no radiometric method or other method that will allow you to date bones any older than a few hundred thousand years. To date, dinosaur bones, for example. You know, scientists believe the dinosaurs became extinct about 65 million years ago. But, you know, so dinosaur bones have to be 65 million years old or older. But there isn't any scientific method that you can use to directly date the bone itself. But there are radiometric methods that allow geologists to date the age of the layers of rock in which you know, the bones, be they dinosaur or human, are, are found. And that's why I was mentioning in connection with the California gold mine discoveries that they were found in layers of rock that according to modern geologists are about 50 million years old. You know, that's been determined not by dating the artifacts or the human bones that were found, but by dating the layers of rock in which they were found. And if it can be shown that the bones or artifacts are not intrusive into the layers in which they are found, in other words, they didn't come from some higher, more recent level, if it can be shown that they belong in the layers of rock in which they were found, then the age the geologically determined age of the rock in which they were found is the age of the artifact or bone that was found solidly embedded in, in that layer. But you could argue that, well, all the dating methods are suspect. But here's what I say to that. You know, I'm trying to have a discussion with mainstream scientists who accept these dating methods and their accuracy. So my method is to say to them, according to methods that you consider reliable, this formation, this layer of stone or sediment is so-and-so many millions of years old. So how do you explain 
the presence in these very ancient layers of rock of these human bones or these human artifacts, then it becomes a problem for them. Either they have to say, well, yes, all our dating methods are unreliable and we really don't know how old those layers of rock really are, or they have to admit that their theories about human origins are wrong and need to be revised, and either way, I win. <laughs> so when you say human bones, you're, you're, I just want to be a little bit specific. You are talking about modern humans as in Homo sapiens sapien. Yeah. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about here, a fairly recent discovery. Just uh, two or three years ago, some archaeologists were doing excavations at Ulduvai Gorge in Tanzania in East Africa. It's a very famous place. Lots of fossils of Australopithecus, and Homo habilis have been discovered there. So these archaeologists found a finger bone in layers of rock 1,800,000 years old. And yeah, you know, this may seem like a, a very minor discovery, and in one sense it is, but there's an important lesson to be learned from it. So the archaeologists very carefully studied this finger bone. It was this finger bone here, you know, on the fifth finger, the little finger, the, the bone just here on the joint. And, you know, they very carefully studied it and measured it. And then they compared the measurements using statistical analysis with the measurements of the same bone from different species of apes and monkeys, you know, gorillas, chimpanzees, baboons, etc. And then they also compared it with the finger bones of Australopithecus and Homo erectus, you know, different kinds of ape men that they recognize. And they also compared it with a sample of finger bones of anatomically modern humans. And they found it fit in the modern human group. It was different from the finger bones of different species of apes and monkeys, different from the finger bones of the known types of hominins like Australopithecus and Homo habilis, Homo erectus. It fits squarely in the modern human group. And here's what they said about it in their publication. It was published in Nature communications. They said, this bone is exactly like that of Homo sapiens, but we can't assign it to Homo sapiens because of its geological age of 1,800,000 years ago. So it just shows how this knowledge filtering process works. You know, evidence for extreme human antiquity can be staring scientists right in the face. They find this finger bone, they carefully study it, they determine it's exactly like an anatomically modern Homo sapiens finger bone. It's found in layers of rock, 1,800,000 years old. They say it's not intrusive. It belongs in the layer in which it was found. Conclusion, I would say you've got myself. I think I muted yeah. myself. Yeah. Did you Good hear person. what I did? You're okay. Well, okay. Just finish the last sentence. 
Yeah. They're saying. You said conclusion? Conclusion. I would say the natural conclusion is you've got evidence for humans like us existing 1,800,000 years ago. What was their conclusion? Well, it looks like Homo sapiens, but it couldn't possibly be because of its age. Uh -huh. Now, so you determine which conclusion is more natural. Yeah, that doesn't sound like science to me. That it, it sounds like you know compartmentalization. It, it, it sounds like as you keep bringing up the the uh, knowledge filtration. Um, just for fun, real quick, I want to show you something that I found. Uh, I was in Alaska. We were on vacation, and we were uh, at a uh, place where you can do gold mining. It's an active gold mine. It's a it's a campground where you can go and stay and do active gold mining in an active gold gold mine site. Um, a place called Chicken, Alaska, which is a pretty remote area. Uh, we were digging in a layer that had about 18 to 20 feet worth of overburden that was constantly being removed by the excavators for for the patrons to to continue to have access to the pay layer. Mm -hmm. And um, and while we were running our little high banker and doing our little gold mining operation there, um, I'm going to hold this up. I found this. And I'll, I'll try to get it close to the camera with good lighting so that you can see what that is. This, I was told, is the tooth of a camel. Yeah, and I was going to say it looked like some kind of tooth. And uh, yeah, the crown, the crown up here is missing. The crown has fallen off of it. And the roots, the, the very bottom part of the roots have, have broken or rotted away. But um, this, I was told, is the tooth of a camel that was roaming around Alaska roughly 100,000 years ago. Amazing. Yeah, they do say there were camel, what they call camelids in North America at that time. Yeah. Okay, so before but we... They would, but they would say there were no humans huh. at that time at 100,000 years ago. Well, somebody had to ride those camels. Right. <laughs> Okay, so listen, you've been gracious. It's been two hours and 40 minutes. Before I let you go, I want to cover the Transvaal spheres for a few minutes, if that's all right with you. These are the, uh, the, med the metallic spheres with protrusions and grooves that were found in a, uh, is it, was it a coal mine in uh, Africa? Is that correct? No, it was a, a mine in a, at a place called Otosdal in the western Transvaal region and you know they're round objects spheres you know one or two inches in diameter and the interesting feature of them is the parallel grooves that go around the equator of each of these sphere-like objects and they're found in mineral deposits about two billion years old and you know they're they're interesting objects they were included in that documentary the mysterious origins of man that aired on nbc and you know we we gave we got some samples from south africa from a museum of natural history at a place called Klerksdorp, which is near the mine. And the director of the museum sent some samples. And we gave them to Bill Cote, the producer, to film. But NBC said before they could be included, in the documentary, they had to be examined by an independent company of metallurgists. 
So that was done. They were submitted to an independent company of metallurgists who examined them. And they said they couldn't explain how the grooves formed. And they determined that the objects were composed of hematite, which is a naturally occurring type of iron ore. It's also considered to be a semi precious stone, you can buy hematite jewelry. So now were, were they, now were these these spheres were they found in addition to uh, human bones and human artifacts? No, these okay. are this is not a case like that. Okay, so so I, my, my, my big question to you was that these Transvaal spheres are they not natural concretions? The considered concretions, is that correct? That's what some would say. But up I mean they come in yeah. all shapes and sizes with various different mineral deposits. Right? They're found yeah. all over the world in all different sizes and different types of minerals. But not exactly like the ones from South Africa. In my book, Forbidden Archaeology. You know, I said, if somebody can actually convince me that they are concretions, I'd be prepared to accept that. Uh, the fact that, you know, like some of them, I haven't seen any concretions, hematite concretions that are exactly like some of the specimens that come from South Africa that are very sphere-like in shape with three or four parallel grooves going around the equator. Now, it's, it's possible that they are concretions, but I haven't seen up to this point anything from other parts of the world that exactly resembles the ones from South Africa. Okay, well, at this point, I just want to turn, give, give my, uh, my listeners a moment or two because I know that there's a, a, roughly a 20-second delay, but um, I want to give my listeners a chance to ask you any uh, last-minute questions. I posted it in the chat. If anybody has questions for our guest, Dr. C or Michael Cremo, uh, put your questions in all capital letters so that I can see who's saying what to whom. And I will put your question to our guest. Um, Gandalf, Amy, Amy, is your computer hanging in there? Do you, can you uh, speak to us, Amy? Uh, I can speak to you at the moment. My CPU is behaving, but it's just about ready to clump again. <laughs> oh, you poor thing. It's you, poor down. <laughs> you poor thing. Gandalf, you got any uh, last minute questions? Oh, wow. I really wish I would have thought about this a little uh, harder. You know, what do you think it will take to uh, wake up mainstream science to the truth, uh, in your opinion? Like, will it take uh, something much more, uh, like, much more substantial than stone tools and stone implements? Or will it take, like, some kind of, like, calculator or a computer being found or a car? Well, you know, for, for real change, I think there have to be some changes in the educational system because even within the scientific world, there is actually some diversity of opinion. I'm actually able to go to scientific conferences and present the kind of evidence that I found and make a case for my point of view. And sometimes my papers are published in mainstream scientific publications. Actually, my latest book, My Science, My Religion, is a collection of 24 papers I've presented at mainstream international scientific conferences about my work. 
So it is part of the scientific discourse. It's a minority voice. The kinds of alternative ideas that I'm talking about and others are talking about are actually present in the mainstream scientific circles, but as a minority voice. The problem is those in the majority have managed to get governments to give them a complete monopoly in the education system so that those who are being trained in these disciplines have to, you know, they're, they're receiving their educations from those who are in the majority. But, you know, normally in countries that consider themselves free and democratic, uh, we don't really tolerate this kind of thing. You know, for example, you know, we wouldn't tolerate historians telling us that uh, we can only include Christianity in histories of the United States. We wouldn't tolerate it. We'd have to say, no, there's been freedom of religion in this country from the beginning. Jewish people have come here. Islamic people have come here. Hindu people have come here, uh, you know, and so on. You know, we w wouldn't say, okay, because it's a majority Christian country, only Christianity could be mentioned in the history textbooks. We wouldn't tolerate that. But we are tolerating at the present moment the majority of scientists being able to have a total monopoly in the education system so that only their ideas are mentioned and everything else is marginalized or eliminated. Therefore, you know, people that are going through this education system, they're only getting part of the picture and they're not seeing the alternatives mentioned except in such a way that totally discredits them. I think the proper thing to do would be to represent in the textbooks in the tax-supported school systems, you know, the, the people are from all different points of view are contributing that tax money and surveys have shown say on the question of human origins that 40 to 50 percent of the american people don't accept the scientific view of human origins with humans appearing fairly late on this planet they accept that humans have been around since the beginning so i would say the proper thing to do is to have textbooks represent the actual diversity of opinion that there is on these questions. I would say, okay, let's admit that today, let's say 95% or 98% of the scientific community accepts you know, a particular theory of human origins. And, and give them 95 or 98% of the classroom time and textbook pages. But the textbook should also include the idea that, yes, although the majority of scientists today accept this or that, there are others who 
accept other ideas and here's why they think so and it should just be presented in a neutral and objective way in some small percentage of the textbook pages and then let the students make up their own minds about what they think <laughs> and I think if that were done gradually we'd see some shifting in the mainstream circles themselves. Well, good luck with trying to get uh, mainstream education to uh, present things in an uh, objective way. <laughs> good luck with that one. Listen, I've got a couple of questions from the chat here. Uh, Swampy wants to know, uh, you were talking earlier about some uh, DNA that you wanted to have tested. Which, uh, what, um, which DNA did? Let me see if I can find that real quick. Let me scroll here. Um, I don't think we've mentioned DNA in this uh, whole talk. I did see. I was a little confused about that too. He said the question was, which DNA test does Michael Cremo want to see? So um, I was a little confused by that. So. Um, if you're not familiar, then okay. Um, here's another question. Um, what, what's the biggest mystery that you want to solve right now? The biggest mystery that I would like to solve is why scientists are so resistant to the idea that consciousness has its own independent existence apart from matter. You know, that's the big mystery I would like to see solved. Um, you know, on that note, I have a, I have a, one last question for you before we wrap this up because we're getting close to our three-hour mark. And thank you so much. You've been so gracious with your time. I can't thank you enough. Um, I was re recently listening to an interview with you and um, uh, Jeffrey Mishlove, and you you spoke of the Devat the pardon me if I screw up the pronunciation here uh, the Devatya or the 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 Devati, Devata and the Advatya being the difference of the conscious self being separate from or equal to the supreme consciousness, and you mentioned that you subscribe to to the Devatya school of thought, meaning that you believe individual conscious self is and has always been separate from the supreme consciousness. Um, yeah. Uh, the, ter the terms I was using are dwaita, dwaita. and adwaita. Dwaita means two or dual. <laughs> and adwaita means not dual. In other words, okay. one. So in Vedic thought, there are two main schools about the nature of the individual conscious selves. One is the idea that they're actually just an illusion and there is only ultimately one conscious self. Everything is one. That's the Advaita school of thought. The tradition that I'm in, the school of thought that I'm in, is one of the Dwaita schools of thought in terms of the overall Vedic philosophy. And the Dwaita school of thought accepts that the individual conscious selves are eternally distinct from the original supreme conscious self. God, you could call it. Uh, okay, so... so so, uh, so ultimately, my question is why? What, what is your main uh, uh, motivation for subscribing to that particular school of thought? For there to be 
an exchange of love, there has to be two. Oh, I got you. Okay. If there's just one, you know, like solitary confinement is considered to be one of the most cruel punishments that you could give somebody to lock them in a room by themselves where they're just alone, singular, without the ability to have a relationship. To have a relationship requires two. I got you. That makes sense. That's ultimately why I'm in favor of the Dwaita school, because as conscious selves, we're always looking for relationship. And the ultimate expression of relationship is the relationship between the individual conscious self and the original supreme conscious self. That is the most powerful experiential relationship that it's possible to have. So that's, and the other school of thought would eliminate that possibility because everything's one. Very interesting. That makes a lot more sense now. Um, on that note, one of my uh, subscribers who's in the chat right now, Lady Zaga, she just said that uh, Canada just recently banned uh, solitary confinement. Or at least, as uh, she says, uh, that uh, it's now limited to 30 days. And so that's, I guess, the maximum. Okay, so that's that's an interesting little gem of information. Thank you, lady. And, yeah, that uh, my, is. I, I, I may use that. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, you've been so gracious. Um, do you have a final thought you want to leave us with? And, and I can't thank you enough for your time. No, it's 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 been fun, and I the final thought I'd like to leave leave with the viewers or listeners is that you know I I don't consider myself to have a, a monopoly on truth, and one of the reasons I like coming on shows like this and hearing the host, hearing the guest, is that I learn new things that are valuable to me, like this nugget of information that just came in from the last caller. It's something I like doing, and I realize that everyone has freedom of thought. I'm happy if people will listen to me but i think it's up to their minds to, up to their own minds to make up uh whether they think what i'm saying is credible or not i respect the freedom of each individual to agree or disagree with anything that i've said and i just appreciate the opportunity to be able to express myself so thanks a lot. Brilliant. Beautiful. And thank you again. Uh, Gandalf, Amy, do you guys want to drop some final thoughts before we get out of here? Well, just to say, uh, Michael Cremo, uh, I've been a fan of yours for a long time, and uh, it was great finally actually talking to you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And while Amy, my computer you... is... Uh... Oh, sorry about that. While my CPU is... Uh sort of behaving i want to thank you for being with us michael you did a wonderful job of bringing information to us and i appreciate it greatly thank you well as always you guys know my final thoughts be good to each other and pick up your trash <laughs> love always michael i'm gonna go ahead and fire up the uh intro but we're gonna call it an outro and uh, I want to thank you one last time for your gracious three hours of time. And um, I, I'm just really just full of uh, gratitude that you have spent so much time with us. And uh, thanks for all that you do.
Okay, I'm looking forward to the next time if there all right. is one. Thank you. Take care, Michael, and we will see you guys all next time. I'm going to screen share, and here comes the outro. Everybody be good. See you guys next week.